So, I'm sorry I lied to you. I have no idea how to talk to girls at parties, but I can talk to you about how to talk to users in your app. I'm Alex, also known as Absa, if you have seen it from my hat, from my pin, and from my uh, badge here. So, I have an interesting curious story on Ethereum, because you could say that my resume is a long list of flopped projects, uh, and a long list of dead and failed projects, but I'm very proud of each one of them, because from, from each one of them, they were built with bricks that have outgrown and outlived the original projects that they, they were. Like, and, and I think you don't actually see that in other industries. It's this, this wonderful thing, I think, about working on open source. But most of all, I'm a designer. <clears throat> and I think the role of the designers in the space is you need to be a translator. Right? You are connecting the users. You need to both understand the project and good enough that you can translate it into simplest words for the users, but you also have to talk to the user and figure out what's really missing, what's, what, what is the real hurt, what is the real problems, and you need to take back that to the engineers who might often not see that because they are not typical users, they are power users. And often they will tell you things like, oh, this, this, we can solve that, this isn't possible. And it's your job as a designer to understand what they're saying, understand what the users are saying, to figure out a way that you can talk back to the engineers in a way that transmits the needs of the user, users. And if needed, you should also be able to talk to the CEO, and that's where user research is very important because you can go there to the test and say, you know what? We are taking this approach, but I tested this other approach, and people were a lot less lost by doing that. And that's why I think it's so important. And I think what if it creates sort of what I call this design gear in which you have user experience, which is this idea of how we want things to work. And then you use that to build your UI, which mostly are what the pixels are. You're pushing pixels around and painting stuff, right? And then use that UI to test with real users to figure out, okay, how much the experience I wanted to give is the experience that they had. And that's, you keep turning on that gear, and at some point you should be connected to the dev gear, and like sometimes you'll be pushing that gear and helping them get along by just doing a lot of tests before they build it. Sometimes they will be coming back to you with, with, with things. So it, it's a little a, a two-way gear. If your dev team is just coming to you saying, we've built this product, make it pretty, then something is going very wrong in that company. And, and I think anyone can do it. And I mean, if you have a startup with three people, you're just the CEO, you don't even have a, a designer, it's just a CEO, the CTO, and like a dev guy. You can still do it with like online tools, and I hope to give them to you. And the first thing I need to, you need to remind is, whenever you're talking to a user, this is not teaching your users how to do your app, this is not a tutorial, this is not a moment where you're do, trying to do a marketing on, on board people. You're listening to them speak. You're not explaining your app. And you need to remember that your app is being tested, not you. So it's not, oh, do you think you can do this in this app? Do you think you can click this button? It's really about, do you think this app will allow you to do this? Do you think that, can you put money in this thing, right? Use generic words like that. And classic user research is basically, there's like one-way way, one way mirror uh, rooms with big prototypes or even like paper prototypes that you build around and just get random people in the office. But if you don't have an office, it becomes a lot harder. And I had to learn that the hard way when I spent like mostly a year working in Balancer doing user, user research. And like there are great tools online. I want to give them a few for you. Usability Hub is a great place where you can learn those things. For instance, five second tests. Just show your app for five seconds and ask questions. You'll be surprised how much of 
before they can read your copy, before they can even understand your app, how much you already form an impression by just looking at it and knowing, okay, you are like an investment thing, you are like a game, you are like a social media, by just taking a look at five seconds. Then you can go one, one, one thing further and just ask the user for a first click. And, just, and by this point, it's just a plain image. Like this can be like that image you're just showing to your investors before you build that product because you want to test it. And you can figure out that, oh, if everyone is clicking on your hero image instead of the button that you want them to click, maybe you shouldn't have a hero image. Maybe you should just show the information they want. And then from that, you can do navigation tests, which it's just slides that you can try to see where people are going. And one of the nice things with navigation tests is that you can use them to benchmark your competitors. You can just screenshot the flow, a typical flow of your competitors, and then screenshot the, the, the flow that you want your, your, your app to, do, to, to test and just see, is it any better? Is it faster? Are people more confused? Sometimes you don't even want to, you just want to see how much people are clicking on the wrong links. That's more important than the, the right links. But mostly, a lot of user research is actually talking directly to people with online meetings. Online meetings, of course, you schedule a meeting with Calendly, get like them on the Zoom or Google Hangouts. But there's also a great website called UserBrain, which allows you to give them a link, give them a script, and then in like about a few minutes, they will give you a, a video of someone using your app and looking at it and describing. And it allows you, again, this great feedback cycle. There were days in which you wake up uh, design a little bit, put a prototype in, throw it to the user, uh, throw it to user brain, go back to like check my emails, come back half an hour later, and there were like three or four uh, videos of people struggling with the prototype I just built. And honestly, you just need often three to five users. It's not a number of a numbers game. You get most insights with like three or five numbers, and then you can just go there, fix it, and create like a new user, user, user thing and like get, get your coffee. And then when you come back, it's like, it's still early in the morning, you've already like run that prototype a few times. And it's not, the reason that often you get those fast videos on user brains is because they are like, you have to pay them. You almost, in almost case you have to pay. User brain may, may like may be expensive, but you know what? What's more expensive is spending weeks of engineering building something that it shouldn't have been built in the first place. Sometimes when you're just having Google Hangout calls, you can like, be creative. I've, I've tried giving NFTs to people that I created. I gave them, I promised them to pay gas fees and which like when gas fees were expensive, that was a, a very nice thing. And I, I, I just was offering people, hey, I want to give you money. I want to give you money to watch you do stuff, which is weird. Right, and that's, that's where you, your users might feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable with that because there's a lot of th things that scammers and user researchers will have in common. Like, both of them are promising you easy money to do something like in 10 minutes. They are asking you to click on shady links, like Figma links or whatever that is. They're asking you to download some browser thing that you allows me to show your app and see you while you watch your wallet, right? So your users might be, like the only difference is one of them wants to see you type your password, the other doesn't. How do you overcome that? First of all, try to use your, yourself as, as, as a leverage. Like if you have a reputation, just tell them, look, I am a real person, I'm not a scanner, you, you know me from whatever. Or sometimes I would start uh, a, a meeting by telling them how to be safe on the internet. Like how to like how do how can you do do a Google Hangout and share just one screen instead of the whole just one window instead of the whole screen, or just tell them I don't want to see your never show your passphrase. Get, get your MetaMask window in somewhere else. And you can also be creative in many ways. So there was a point in which I wanted to know: uh, Is there a way that we can like, like a pool? The Balancer is a DeFi app and had these pools and we had like, there's a lot of information that goes in a pool and I was wondering, can you like translate that into a tiny icon? I wanted to know how small the icon can be. And I created a little game, a prototype game, which I just ask users, can you find the die? The fastest person to find all the dies in like this Google Captcha thing will win. And of course I didn't care for people who find the, to find the dies. What I cared is that as, each step was progressing, I was making the icon tinier, tinier, until at some point all they had to work with was a two-color gradient, 
and they still found it. And it's a great way for you to understand, oh my God, like you, you can reduce it a lot by just making it small, right? And another super important thing is that options are never equal. We will often happen that you have a system in which there are two modes, right? Balancer had two modes in which you had deposit money. It doesn't actually matter what the modes are because for the user it's just wah, 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 right? It's just random noise for them. And the wrong way to do it is just to ask the user to, like, if we have two modes on the system, we have two modes on the UI. And that's often the worst way to do it. First of all, you can do a little, a better job by just selecting a default. Just, it forces you to think about the default, forces you to think about which one is better. Often I've seen people who would think that mode A would be more important because everyone on the team was using mode A, but turns out mode B was the most common because most users don't have all the tokens or have connected their wallets or have done all the things that most people in your like, dev department have. But a better way is don't make it a choose choice thing, just make a checkbox and then you have to explain it in a tooltip, no, never try to, like, your users do not read, and there's this, often this mistake of thinking that your users, they must understand your app, when the opposite is true, you must understand your users and try to reduce whatever explanation is there into like a five word explanation. But a better yet is, instead of having your users pick a choice, just allow your users to do whatever they want and just add later a little thing saying, hey, click this button and we'll, like I, mean, I see you're trying to do X, click this button, you save money or, or something like that. Often it gets even worse when you have like multiple options there. So try to make them in different ways. Maybe one is a checkbox and the other is an action. You have like one big submit button. Maybe you have two submit buttons. Notice that the submit, I also picked the, I also picked the default in both of them. Because like one is big, one is the normal. Something it's also great if you're a designer who can code a little bit. You should try Framer, which is an odd, wonderful, wonderful thing. Because often in an app, you are thinking about some sort of behavior. And uh, is there a way that I can like make the video go? Okay, can you yeah, just click there? Often you are thinking about something, and then in the end. Yeah, it's going. You're thinking about a behavior that you can only understand when you see it. So this way I was testing a thing where I realized, oh, you can put money in many ways. You can select it by the pri amount of tokens you have, the percentage of tokens, the dollar value. Maybe you can click on, on, the, on, the, on the total and uh, you can type it and you can scroll it. And it was like a wonderful idea on the design space. But of course, when I tested with users, they were all confused on wait. I clicked this and I clicked click that, and it's all confusing, right? But it's, it's the kind of behavior you only understand when you actually make it work with real, oh, yeah, this, can you click the video there? Thank you. Uh, and, and then, hello, yeah, thank you. So, and then I realized that there's a lot of things you can do by just testing the behavior of people. You just allow people to they click around and do whatever they want and just, allow them to click around and check, hey, if you click this button, suddenly your numbers will change here. Because numbers are also UI. If there's a button there and they realize, oh, if I click this, then this goes up, this goes, this goes down, it, it really it simply works. And you can do a lot of things like that in which you can, like, and those are the, the sort of behaviors you only realize when you are like, just running a live app. And that's something that you can do as a designer all alone in your office and then keep testing it, keep testing it, keep testing it. And it's, it's, it's really important. Don't overdo it because I've seen cases where everything is clickable, everything is great, and the user is just clicking things around. He has no understanding of what they're doing, but they're just glad that they, they, like they disable. It becomes a game of can I disable all the warnings, right? I'm going to click around until all the warnings are gone. Other things. There's always a, like a, a Facebook moment whenever you're talking to a user. And I think this is one of them, where the, we had like a little box just setting all the actions that have happened. And then I realized that users are a little confused about that. that. And then I realized that they don't know that this is a feed of actions. They think that this is an, a menu of things that they should be doing. And then, yeah, maybe you should, we can de redesign it as a social feed. And that's another thing in which, uh, like, you come back to your product team and they were going to say it's sort of impossible because not everyone has ENS name, not every ENS name has photos. 
that's okay, you can solve that. Just give them nickname, nicknames, just call them whales, give them emojis, right? The problem is just make it look like it's something more that they expect it, like activity. And finally, there are a lot of ways and a lot of moments in which you're struggling with words, struggling with trying to understand and explain a concept to your users or even to yourself that you actually don't need to, that you need to take a different approach. A lot of my time I spent in balance, I was thinking about what is impermanent loss. Every DeFi project has this issue, the, I'll, I'll call it divergence loss, in which you put money, but if like one token goes up by 10% and the other goes up by 20%, in the end, you lose money by putting it in the pool instead of just keeping it with, with yours. And then when they try to explain it, it feels weird. They put it gra gra graphs like this. But in the end, like what the user wants to know, it's not whatever is the impermanent loss. They want to know something very simple. I have one token A, I have one token B, and that's the value that they have together, that portfolio, over like a month or like in dollars, eaters, whatever, right? And if I had invested in your app, that's how much money I would have. And of course, you can see that the user is better off by not investing in the app. And that's true for most DeFi apps. And I think that's a great pattern because I think most apps don't actually try to solve that problem because they realize that by solving that visualization, the user will re might realize that, oh my God, they're losing money. I should not be putting my money on, on, on this Uniswap pool, right? And that's the wrong way, wrong way to think it. You need to think in a different way and realize that's not the whole story. There's, there's not only the, the divergence loss thing. There's also like fees. You collect some fees as things are traded. Sometimes like that can make up for the divergence loss thing. Some other protocols will give out liquidity incentives, right? Just by the fact that they are, you're using it, they're they going to give you like other tokens. And some others will like put your tokens to work, to put in on staking platforms, on lading platforms. And it's all sort of complicated, and it's all sort of complicated to explain. Often they will tell you, look, this is the API, this is the APB, this is the impermanent loss, this is the amount of tokens you get in terms of measuring tokens, this is the amount of thing you have measuring dollars. But really, what the user just wants to know is what I call this like rainbow short that I develop, which is just the, the dotted line is what would happen with my tokens if I did nothing, and the color bars are everything that this app does for you. And the interesting thing about this is that that little difference, I'm not sure you can see it before the, 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 gray, the bottom gray, bottom green, and the dotted line is impermanent loss. That's how you visualize it. That's the best way I've learned to visualize it. But the funny thing is that by finding the best way to visualize it, I learned that you don't actually need to visualize it. You don't actually need to explain it to the users. Right? All, you need, all they care about is not the bottom of the bar, it's the top of the bar. It's, and that helps you explain what the product is. Your product is just taking that and doing all that stuff to make your money work for you, right? And then you can take all the other information, like the volume trading, etc., and put it in a in a in an order. And I think that was one of the that was one of the best ways I could explain to someone how your API works into a DeFi protocol. And I haven't seen anyone do like a solution like this. If, if you're a DeFi guy, just feel free to use it, right? But my point here is that in order to get there, you need both to understand deeply the product by just understanding, okay, this is, this is what we do. This is what this divergent, like what is divergent loss? But you also need to understand the, the user. What does the user really want to know, right? What do they really care about? They just care about how much money they made. And I think you were in the middle trying to connect something that is complicated with something that the user wants into something that is roughly easy to look. And other great insights I've had is often never treat an unknown variable as zero. Very, very often your user, like, just the fact that you don't know how many tokens you have in your user wallet doesn't mean that they have zero tokens. Maybe just because that information hasn't loaded yet, that doesn't mean it's zero. And often I've seen users fall into errors because they were like, they would open the app, there were a bunch of errors, and those errors were not like actual errors. It was just that because the users were, had not collected or something had not loaded, a lot of issues are like that. 
don't tell users, show them things. As I, as I said before, is like often instead of trying to explain your user how to do it, just allow them to click around. And like, if, if you want to tell, look, if you click this button, this thing will happen. Just allow them to click the button, and they will see the thing will happen. Because numbers are also UI, right? And I think that it goes for both of them. Uh, often I would ask a user saying, look, what is this number represents? And they would think a little bit and think, I think this number represents that number multiplied at that number. And they would like do it in their head. And if it, if it made sense, they would be, yeah, that's, that's it. I, I found it. They would be gratified. So often, just showing numbers and allowing people to think with numbers or just saying, look, this, this way is cheaper than that other way, that's the best UI you have, right? If you just, like, you can put like a red button, but if they tell you this way is $5 cheaper, they will find and click that, that, little, like, that little icon there. Uh, and users love to see other users, like just allow them to see action in your app. Like they always would love when you would say, oh, I had a user who would, would, would say that he would liked watching the activity on a pool because they, he knew that every time a user traded, he was going to get a few cents on that. And he was like, yay, someone traded. I just got a little more, more money on that. And if you do it live, they will love it. And finally, avoid great patterns often not solving an issue is an issue. And I think a lot of DeFi protocols do this because like, they are not sure how to solve it or they are not sure, uh, like, or, or as I said, like, by solving it, showing them the information, the user might realize it's not a good idea. Just think about it, you can certainly solve that. That's the main message I wanna tell you is that like, as a designer, your goal is to connect both sides. And as a, as a developer or as a CEO or as anyone in your company, you can be that designer. You can be someone who can try to always connect and talk directly with users because you have to know your non-customers also. Just the people in your Discord server, they are not your market fit, right? They're often people who like are are already most knowledgeable about your project. What you really want is people to, who don't understand the product and you need to go there and grab them and make them understand the product. And that's it, thank you. You can find me on Twitter as, at Avsa and I really like thank the whole Balancer team that helped me during the year and the whole ENS community that I've been working on the past year. Thank you. I think I have time for questions. Hey Alex, great talk. Um, we will try to utilize the stuff that you said in Rotki. Uh, but I'm really curious, how can I get girls at parties? Like, that, that's what I came to know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lied about uh, talking to girls at parties. I only know how to talk to users. Um, I have um, no idea what, what the other. Okay, I'll keep searching. Thanks a lot. <laughs> other question? Hey, great talk. Uh, can you tell about uh, good ways to reach users online? that don't seem like a scam? In yes, so I often had this problem because like every week I was having to reach out to users. And at some point I, I started like reaching out to our Discord community and reach out to Twitter. There's a point in which people are just get, like you just can keep, keep, keep asking people to click and click. Hey, can you click this link? Can you do me a favor? Can you click this? Can you participate in this test? You have to be creative. There are some apps that you just give you out, like that, that you, like, I, like User Brain or Usability Hub. They, you can just pay and they will get users for you. Often you have to, like, I think incentivization is a good, in, good, in, good, good thing there. Just tell, look, uh, whoever clicks this link and completes this form, you get A, uh, a B, and C. Like schedule a meeting with me, you get $10. So, like complete this form and you get like one die. Uh, like talk to me with one hour and I will like, there was a moment, I, I, one day, one time, I promised everyone I would pay every gas fee or whatever they did while they were, I was watching. And one guy literally said, oh my God, I'm, like, on the video, he could say, okay, that's great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be withdrawing and depositing a ton of stuff because the gas fees are expensive and I know you're, you're, you're buying it, you're paying for me. But it, eventually, it, it was a great video because he was like, oh, damn, I, I he need to follow those instructions and I just can't do whatever I want. And then just by seeing him like going and withdrawing his money and et cetera, it was super useful information. And yes, I paid his gas fees and he, everyone was happy. So you just need to be creative, I guess. Hi, Alex. Uh, here. <laughs> nice to meet you. 
Um, do you think with Web3 user research should be, or is any different from Web2 user research? I think one of the main things I've seen it different is that uh, there are a lot of apps that you, you allow you to like record someone like just clicking around the website, right? But in order to that you you only get people who don't have like a wallet ready, right? And often, if you want to see someone actually using web website with a wallet, you need to be recording them on a Google Hangout, and then, as I say, they will be uh, be uneasy about that because you're like. Why do you want me to watch like two transactions and it's complicated because they might be worried about you like getting some information. I think that was the main difference for me. It was first of all making sure that I was reaching those the people who had uh, who had like MetaMask, who had everything installed, but those were precisely the people who would not be like very likely to just be like be using their wallet while some way weird guy was watching. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I mean, you just mentioned the tools that, uh, I mean, you can use to record the users and so on. Uh, do you think, I mean, we also have the, the team from Rotkey here that are focusing a lot on privacy. Uh, do you think, especially when we talk about DeFi and about users interacting with their own funds, do you think that's, a, that, that's something that users might feel, I don't know, that their privacy is breached or... Uh, just following them and recording their actions on the website. Yes, uh, and like their privacy is being breached because you're recording. So I, I think you're not talking necessarily about uh, user research, you're talking about more analytics. And I think, I actually think that user research can help solve a lot of the problems with analytics, right? If you just create a website with a bunch of trackers everywhere, you get basically the same information that you get if you just watch five users uh, use your website, with the difference is that those five users have consented to be in your research thing. While when you do analytics, you're making your website slower and you're like collecting a bunch of information that can be used against every single user in a future leak or something like that, right? So that connects like their, their IP address to their, to their to their transaction things, and I think that's a lot more dangerous. So I think just, they, if you're trying to analyze an app, just a blockchain app, you can just do on-chain analytics that is already public, and do user research that you could do, you, you probably have almost the same insights as the, the like, a super Google Analytics thing. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Un aplauso.